Ladies and gentlemen, you know him, you love him, you take it away. Grab the mic and let's talk, my friend. I was doing some research on you, Mike, because that's what I do. And you have, your IMDb bios has, you have a couple of records that I don't know if you're aware of. Um, hmm. Did you know that you have the record for most original stories turned into franchises? Oh, uh, someone did tell me that, yeah. Um, I was on a talk show and in London, I think, and someone told me that. Yeah, that's pretty cool, right? I was like, I read that, and I was like, I'm going through the list. I'm like, yeah, I mean, that would make sense. Yeah, I did a lot of franchises. I'm really, really lucky, very fortunate in my life. And from 1980 to 1990, you are tied with someone of a very high esteem of the most films made in that time. Yeah. You and G. Hackman. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's very hard to take credit for anything as an actor because you, you're you really part of a team in a movie and you're part of an agency that gets you the jobs and you know you, you have to know your skill so you have to show up being able, if you're a carpenter you have to show up being able to build a house but the chances that you're chosen to build that house are so so hard to achieve, so hard to to get. So I think so much that God and luck comes into it. Um, and maybe everybody here, you find that in your lives too, that you know, you could have gone right or you could have gone left, and divine guidance told you to go right, and then it all worked out. So for me, um, you know, I, like I remember um, when I was up for Cocoon, it was between me and Nicolas Cage. And oh, can I just absorb that mental image? <laughs> <laughs> Nicolas Cage in that role. So to me, today, it would be like, there's no question, I would hire Nicolas Cage. <laughs> you, get, you get Nicolas Cage. I mean, why on earth would you hire Gutenberg, <laughs> but at that moment, God gave me the job. Now, the truth is, Nicolas Cage won the Academy Award for Best Actor in Leaving Las Vegas. And if you watch him in his work, he's fascinating. He's extraordinary, he's from like another planet, um, which I think most really great actors are, they're from another planet. But, um, so I got lucky, and I got lucky in, a lot of pictures, like Police Academy was originally offered, before me, was offered to Michael Keaton. Oh, and, and, wow. and he was just coming off of Night Shift. And he got a lot of heat, and he had a lot of offers, and you know, he, he had 20 offers. So he said no, and then they started to screen test guys, and it was between me and a guy named David Naughton. He was a wonderful actor. He was in Werewolf uh, in London. Yeah, you know? American Werewolf. American Werewolf in London. He's a brilliant actor, so talented. And we both screen tested. And I remember I drove home. Well, actually, I was outside the, the stage and I kind of cracked the door to listen and see how it was going for him. And the crew was hysterical. They were clapping and they were laughing and they were going crazy over this guy. And I'm out there and I'm, I'm out there with my dad's police academy shirt that he, he gave me, and I'm like, this is like the biggest waste of time. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, I parked, you know, they gave him a parking spot right in front of the stage. My parking spot was outside the studio. I had to like walk for like a half hour to get to the studio. And, uh, so I remember closing the door, and I, you know, they had no cell phones then, but anyway, the guy came out and said, you're up, and I go, what am I even coming in for? And this guy, and he came in, there, the, the director was hugging him, and he oh, you're so talented. He's like, I, you can sing, you can dance. And he's going, I'm right here. And I'm like standing there going, what am I doing here? So he goes, uh, uh, Gloverman, 
Are you ready? Oh my god! <laughs> Stripes and Officer and a Gentleman. Oh, I like that. To me. And I thought it was a really funny script. Because it was, a, you know, it was a very easy concept. A guy gets in trouble with the law, and the judge says you will either go and do community service, which is police academy, or you go to jail. And that's like a, for, for thousands of years, the, you know, the, the Greeks were doing that. You know, you either go get eaten by the lions, you know, go to the Coliseum and, you know, become fodder for the gladiators, or you become a slave to Phil. And you've got to be slave, Phil's slave for two years. And he's like, well, I'll, I'll, I'll take the slavery, you know? <laughs> so that's funny. And it's always been funny. So I thought, that's a funny idea. Then the guy's trying to get kicked out, which is funny. Then he falls in love with a girl, smart writing, and that's why he wants to stay. Mm. He doesn't want to be kicked out now because he fell in love with a girl. So simple, but it, you know, it worked. And then, and then the director, a guy named Hugh Wilson, who was did WKRP in Cincinnati. Oh, that's oh. Yeah, he was a really smart guy. He knew, you know, he was the kind of guy. Who, uh, like I put the bottle down here, he goes, "That's not funny. Put it here, near the edge, more funny. Because now we're going to be watching. Maybe it'll fall off." So he knew how to make everything funny, and, and I knew it was going to be a hit. I just, I'm very good at knowing when something's crap, and I'm doing it for the money, and I, you know, I want to work, and I'm sitting there going, this is no work. I want to work. But, you know, nothing happens in your apartment, but a lot, it's all about momentum. A good friend of mine named Jake Steinfeld, who's an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. but he's body by Jake, mm -hmm. he always says mm -hmm. momentum. So even if you're gonna do, you got a good job, a good job, and then a shitty job, you take the shitty job, because it's another little stepping stone to another thing. Because someone on the, maybe on the shitty job, some guy will go, be talking to somebody and go, you know what, that job was shitty, but he was great. And his niece is very popular. Haley Steinfeld is his niece. That's his brother. But when you meet channels 15 and 16, should be the, to the right, I think that's yeah. what's causing the line noise. There we go. No, it's not again. 
I'm not mm. being geek, so I'm very sensitive. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Early on, you did a project called The Boys from Brazil. How many people can say, oh yeah, I did a project with Lawrence Olivier and Gregory Peck? Really lucky. Yeah. I was, I was uh, 18. And um, I went, what happened was I was in Hollywood for a year. Right out of high school, at 17, my parents let me go to Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> we laugh now, like, I would never send a 17 year old to Hollywood now. That's just crazy. I'm not trying to send a 17 year old to Houston at this time. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I went out there, and I, I, in those days, no computer, so I could fudge my age. I say I was 18, but I wasn't. So I worked for a year and I did really well, and uh, but I hated Hollywood. You know, you hear all the stories about the culture of Hollywood, it's a tough on culture. And for a young guy who was used to authentic love, my family and my friends, the love of Hollywood is a different type of love. So after a year, I just didn't want to do it anymore, so I quit. I went up to Albany State University to start my life as a normal person. And then I got a call from my agent saying, they want to see you for this movie. So I went down to New York and I got the job. And I went to Portugal. And I immediately uh, got close with uh, Olivier, Lawrence Olivier, and Gregory Peck, and James Mason. And James Mason was in one of my favorite movies of all time, the, the original uh, A Star Is Born. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And. Um, I just, and Greg Peck, of course, and all the great movies, Keys to the Kingdom, and all his, you know, Roman Holiday, and Guns of Navarone, and Olivier, you know, Henry V, and Wuthering Heights, and I knew all these movies, so I, I got to spend so much time with these guys. They were very friendly and, and open, and I was alone, so uh, they took me in. I, I, I was very lucky to do that picture. And remember, guys, we're here for you. I can sit here and talk to this man. All oh yeah, day. if anybody's good. And I'm sure he's like, you don't have to talk to me all day. It's okay. <laughs> we got mics on either side, so if you want to ask your questions, it looks like we have one. Do you have a question, or are you just okay, you just hanging out? That's cool. <laughs> I get it. I get it. Let's talk a little bit about now, because we were talking while we were waiting for you to join us about conventions and how conventions have revitalized so much. Can you speak a little bit about your experiences since you've been on the convention circuit and things of that nature? Well, I haven't done one in many years. This is my first in many years. I've been taking care of my dad um, for five years and he passed last year. Sorry. Thanks. That's tough. So, I haven't done one in many years, but I've had the nicest experience here. People are so friendly and so kind and, um, and I've, connected with people like yourself like I've never connected before, you know. The audience, the audience are individual people with their individual struggles of life, joys of life, life stories, but everybody is going through something, everyone. And what I've found when I'm signing autographs and saying hello to people, is that I'm connecting with people in a way that I haven't before. I don't know if it's my father's death that's really changed me, and maybe some of you have lost a parent that you're close to, and it really affects you. But it's affected me in a profound way. And um, so I noticed the eye contact I have now with people is different. I'm looking for, I'm looking for you. You know, a lot of people say, you know, I go, how you doing? Great. Well, they're not really great, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but you have to say great in this casual world because a lot of people don't want to hear your problems. You know, you can't go, well, I had a really tough day or a tough year or something. A lot of times there's just no room for that, so you say great. But I'm actually looking in their eye to say what's, what's really going on. So anyway, today, this is my only day. I came this morning. I'm going to leave tonight. But... I feel like I'm connecting with people in, in, in a better way, and that I appreciate people like yourselves metaphorically coming to my store and liking what I, the shoes that I make. Because I'm in the service business. 
I'm, I'm here to serve you. That's my job. And, um, and I think I, not that I didn't respect the audience, I think that I respect the audience in more of an individual way, that every single person is really important and really grateful that they like my work and like what I do. We're all different, you know, some guys are the macho guys, some guys are the, you know, everybody has a different persona. I never knew what my persona was, but I think that I, I kind of want to be the guy trying to understand this journey. And then at one point it's over. You know, I remember looking at my dad in the box and I just, it was such a small box. There's not a lot of room in there. And I don't care if you're Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos, you don't get a 20,000 square foot coffin, you know, with a gourmet kitchen and a screening room and you get a little box. So no matter who it is, like Jimmy Buffett passed the other day, Jimmy Buffett. Who would have ever thought Jimmy Buffett would pass this soon? I mean, he was as alive as ever, or any of the greats, Cary Grant, or any of the greats, Gary Cooper, or no matter who you are, at one point, no matter how important you are, or you think you are, you're gonna go. So, I think I appreciate the audience a lot more than I ever did, and this convention gave me an ability to uh, recognize that even more. You guys did that. You guys did that. Wow. It was, you know, it was just a guy talking, but. I think you talked about your persona. From a fan standpoint, I think a lot of the reason for, and I, I can speak for myself here, of the Enjoy Labor movies because you're you're in everything. You're the guy that, that we could see ourselves as. Maybe not, you know, having the choice between putting this academy in jail. But <laughs> a guy that you could look to and go, I could see myself in that. Whether it was something like you're working with a robot or you're working with a mysterious force that keeps keeps people I mean that that cast alone blows my mind like a cocoon. Yeah. I mean, you go back that, and it's, it's still watchable. I, I, that comes out, I can watch it right yeah. now. But you've also have been fortunate enough from my research, you've been able to get back quite a bit that I don't think gets recognized enough. You wrote a kid's book at one point called The Kids from Disco. You wanna talk about that a little bit? Yeah, just, I, I, I wrote a book about my nieces and nephews and their uncle who's sort of stuck in the 70s. And then, um, yeah. <laughs> and then they found out that he's a, a superhero. And then they also don these costumes and get superpowers and, and sort of save the world from a, a villain who doesn't like music. So he wants, he wants to eradicate all music on the earth. Fun little children. I feel like it's time to maybe revisit that in, in an age where all of these kinds of things are getting made. I think that fits in right now. Yeah. Yeah, a couple of people are looking at it. Do you have the Goom House Project? Yeah. Um, I used to feed the homeless every weekend. Some friends of mine, Jill and Al Siegel, used to do it also. They would get three or four loaves of bread, salami, bologna, some cookies, and make sandwiches, and put them in brown paper bags and give them out to the homeless. Mm. So I started doing it. And then I found uh, a lot of the homeless were actually educated people, but you can't get a job unless you have an address, and you can't get an address unless you have a job. So I wanted to open up a home for homeless people. And if you really are trying to get somewhere, then you can have an address, and then go on interviews and get jobs. But the state wouldn't let me do it because they wouldn't let homeless people live near other people in a home. But a friend of mine said, you know, a lot of foster kids, when they get emancipated at 18, they go on the street and they have nowhere to go. So I, I thought, you know what, maybe I'll open up a home. And we did in, um, in uh, South LA near, near the airport um, with 
we bought this house and the state helped me. And there's two bedrooms on the bottom, two bedrooms on the top, two apartments, and it's for girls. And uh, you have to be sober, be, pardon me, in school or have a job. And, um, and then you're emancipated from the foster system. And then, so we opened it up in 2020 and we've had uh, about, about 70 girls, 80 girls go through it. Some of them had babies and stuff, but I'll tell you a really funny story. I think it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> My sister says, let me tell you, it's funny. <laughs> so I would go there every month the first month, Monday of every month for lunch. Because I would take the girls to lunch. There'd be four girls living, some had babies, you know. So we'd go to, you know, Chili's or something and we'd have lunch. And I'd say, how's school? How's your job? You know, are you guys staying clean? All that, right. So I would do it for like, I did it for like almost a year. So I showed up one day, the girls would change, you know. They would leave, they would come and go. So I came to the house one day and I knocked on the bottom door and a girl came with a baby that I didn't recognize. So I said, oh, hi, are, are, are you new? She goes, yeah, I just moved in two weeks ago. Um, are you Steve? I go, yeah, she goes, come in. So I came in and I go, where's Elise? There was another girl living there. You know, she's not here right now. I go, oh, we're supposed to have lunch today. You know, are you gonna come? She goes, no, I'm not coming. I go, oh. The two girls up top, are they coming? No, they're not coming. Go, Wait a minute. We're supposed to have lunch. This is, it's called Gutenhaus. <laughs> <laughs> There's a parallel. <laughs> you know, so every Monday we're supposed to have lunch. And she goes, can I talk to you? Said, yeah. She goes, sit down. Sit down. And we decorated a beautiful cherry wood, beautiful. Had a Beverly Hills designer decorate. And, everything. and she goes, I don't know how to break this to you, but they don't want to have lunch with you anymore. I go, why? They go, they think you're boring. <laughs> they say you ask the same question every day. How's school? How's the job? Are you straight? Are you, they don't want to hear it anymore. They don't want to sit there and be bored at Chili's with crappy food. And I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> and then she goes, they're not here? <laughs> so I walked out and I called my aunt who was 94 years old. I went to a pay phone and I called her. And, you, and she inspired me to do this. I go, can you believe it? They're not there. This, I built this house. I spent my money. And, blah, blah. and she said, whoa, this is not your house anymore. It's their house. And they, you don't rule what they do. You just you know, wanted to have lunch with them once a month. And be quite honest, you are kind of boring. <laughs> <laughs> the state is not going well. <laughs> oh, that's my <laughs> I haven't been there since. <laughs> I mean, I've drove, driven by like a priest. You know, like, <laughs> like, took the name off, go down south. You've done stage as well. Is there a role right now that is your your movie your, your great wide role? Sure. What's like what's that one role like I get this role of course. I do it. Of course. Well, I just got done doing five months of a play in New Brunswick, New Jersey, and Sag Harbor, Long Island, of a play that I wrote. So I just got done doing stage. Can you talk about it? Yeah, it's about, it's actually about my mom and dad letting me go to Hollywood. At 17. <laughs> <laughs> See, it all comes back around. <laughs> all the characters I met out in Hollywood, you know? And then about my mom and dad. But for the, Ameri for the actor, there's two roles. The male actor. One is Willie Loman in Death of a Salesman. And the other one is King Lear. Ooh. So those are the two roles that if you're, and if you want to say, What's the two roles that every actor at the end of his career goes, I played Lear and I did Willie Loman. You know, you did it. <laughs> so for me, and, those, and, and King Lear could take two years, you know, four hours a day memorization. You know, in fact, when you go see King Lear and you see somebody doing it, like John Lithgower, 
course, Olivier, right? Holy smokes. And same with, you know, of course, Death of a Salesman, I'd like to do that. Hmm. <coughs> Was there a moment in your career that you can point to and go, that's the moment that I knew this was going to be my path going forward. No. It just all kind of just happened? No, I, I don't think I still trust it. You know, at any time, you could become cold. And I've had many cold periods where I, I haven't worked. And the phone just stops ringing. I'm, I'm not a tortured artist. I'm a pragmatist, I'm a realist. You know, I could have done another job. And I probably would have been really happy. I mean, I could have worked in a hardware store and maybe become the manager, and eventually own the hardware store, and maybe I would be really happy, you know? So, I still think to myself, if it, you know, if it stops and I just don't want to do it anymore, I could do something else. Um, I could be, you know, the star of my hardware store, or, you know, be, uh, I just want to be a bright light wherever I work. So, I want to keep working as an actor, and I love it, and I think I have a unique voice, not my voice, but a, a unique presence that I can add to film and TV and theater. But I also have to realize if it, if they, if it stops, that I won't die. I can do other things and be happy. Um, but I'm not gonna lie, getting a job is really exciting. You get a phone call, they want you. Oh my God, they want me. And I think as an actor, I think you have to be a little strange to become an actor because <laughs> you kind of live off that stuff. Like they want you. Oh my God, remember Sally Field? When she got her Academy Award, you <laughs> like me. You like me. You love me. You like, like me. Really, 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 really like, like me. me. I mean, and I worked with Sally, and she's one of the greatest actresses of all time. She won two two Academy Awards, and she's a great director. She directed some of the picture I was in because the director didn't know what to do, and she knew she was brilliant. But even someone who is so capable, so capable, who's more capable than Sally Field? Gidget, Flying Nun, Norma Ray, I mean, Academy Award, Golden Globe Awards, Emmy Awards. For her to say, you like me, to an actor's like, you like me, you like me. We are effed up. <laughs> I mean, if you gotta like get like strangers to like you, like me, and the phone rings, Steve, yeah, they want you. Oh my God, they want me. Oh, the day is great. You know, now I'm in a happy mood. You know, you guys want to do, yeah, I'll do that, you know. And if you get the phone call, they don't want you. Oh, I suck. You know, hey, do you want to go for ice cream? No. Uh, it's terrible how it has an effect on you. So the big picture is I could do something else. And it might, there are days when I think, you know, it might have been better if I did do something else. I might have had a, happier life. Now, you know, my my friends or people have said, oh my God, you'd be so, you know, you don't want to do, you don't want to work in a hardware store your whole life, whatever. My father had a great line. You know, between New York and LA, there's 300 million people living happy lives. You know, there's a lot of shit out there that you can do. So you're not going to be George Clooney. Big deal. There are a lot of people who are very happy working, right, you know, Industry jobs, regular jobs. We still got a few minutes. If you guys have questions, come up to the mic. Grab the mic because we want to be able to hear you. Yeah, well, you could hear me. You know why? Well, we're also we're also <laughs> writing tape. <laughs> uh, what's your name? My name is Adam. Adam, what can we do for you? Uh, I well, this thing's been sitting in front of me the whole time. So I don't <laughs> know how difficult was it with the machine to do the acting, and, and like breakdowns, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's the same thing. Acting is is true emotion in, in an artificial environment, right? So you're playing the doctor doing, you know, delivering the baby. Come on, come on, you can do it. And the woman says, ah, I can't believe it, it's the pain, the pain, ah, the baby. You're really not in the hospital, right? You're in a set, the 
guy's eating a sandwich and waiting for lunch, you know, <laughs> you can just see it. Same thing with the robot. It's just acting. So I act, I imagine that he's real, but he's not, because there's 20 guys behind him. You know? <laughs> but, so it, I, everyone always said to me, like, when you do CGI or work with inan inanimate objects of some sort, but it's the same. Well, there's a lot of malfunctions on set. You mean like it broke down? Yeah, yeah. It's no big deal. You know, it's it's like, all right, so it's got to be fixed and everything. I, as I said, I I really pride myself on not being a difficult guy, especially at work. You know, um, the key is to be the easygoing guy. You don't want to be the guy who gets so mad. This effing robot won't work. <laughs> I'm leaving. I'm getting my car and driving away. Well. You know, I don't want to be that guy. Yeah. I want to be the guy going, okay, I'll, whenever you get it fixed, I'll be able to do my job again. Hmm. But not to get crazy. Same thing with I'm working with a person. You know, we're doing a scene and the person is in a bad mood or the person's nasty or the person is late or the person, you know, I like to get to the set first. Like when they knock on my door, I go. I don't wait and all that. I want to be on. I want to be next to the camera first. So they're going, "Where's Steve?" Oh, here he is. You know, I don't want to go. Where's Steve? Where's Steve? So like I've been on work, you know, when guys are twenty minutes late, three hours late, no problem. Because it isn't. Yeah, I'll give some love to Adam for that question. That's a great question. <laughs> you walk in today and you see this. What was your reaction? Because I know what mine was when I saw it. Oh, I love him. You know, I, I mean, he was before we were doing some photo ops together. But it's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful machine, and the creators are right here. Y'all give us how about we talk about the <laughs> I could I could watch this all day. <laughs> what's the what's is there a story that you have that you don't get to tell enough that you want to tell right now over your career? Like, do you have a stairway to heaven story that you haven't told in a while and, and you can share with us? Yeah. Okay. Let's go. <laughs> this is a good one. All right, well, here. It's a little, it's a little dirty, but not serious. <laughs> so when I was uh, 17, I went out to California. I lived with my godfather. He was my parents' good friend, and he was very successful. He was a voiceover guy. So he had a mansion in Mulholland Drive in Beverly Hills. So he let me stay there. He also had a beach house in Montecito, Santa Barbara. So he said, I'm going to my beach house for the week. You know, you'll stay alone. You'll be all right. I go, yeah, I'll be all right. So uh, I was doing, I was an extra on a, on a, on a uh, commercial. And one of the girls on the commercial was a little older than me, very good looking. And, um, you know, I was like, I'm gonna ask this girl out, you know? <laughs> so I, 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 and she was like a principal of the show. So I, I asked her out and she said, yeah, I'll go out with you. 
So she said, what night? And I said, oh, Friday night. She goes, okay, great. So um, I had a little pacer, you know, one of these cars. <laughs> so I picked her up. And she had like a lot of money, but we, anyway, went out to dinner. And um, she said, where do you live? So I said, uh, Mohawk Drive. <laughs> and I go, uh, you know, going to take you home? She goes, oh, let's go to your house. And I was like, <laughs> Technically. Okay. So we drove my patient to the house, and he had a Rolls Royce in the driveway. And she's like, and she's like oh, wow, is that your car? I go, yeah. yeah. <laughs> she goes, why didn't you drive it? I go, it's too showy. <laughs> drive it special occasions. And she's like, all right. So we walk into the house, and it's, you know, gorgeous. She goes, I remember her name was Lois. And she goes, is this your house? I go, yeah, yeah. She goes, really? I go, yeah, I go, I come from family money. So we walk around the house, and there's pictures of my godfather everywhere. <laughs> His girlfriends, whatever. And she's like, who are these people? And I go, oh, and my uncle. And I, and she goes, there's a lot of pictures of them everywhere. I'm very close with him. <laughs> He's coming next week, so I put his pictures out. So, uh, I'm trying to get something going with this woman, you know. So she finally, we, you know, we get on the couch and we're kind of amorous a little bit. And then she says to me, uh, and I'm 17, I'm like, I never did it. So she says, uh, why don't we go to your bedroom? And I go, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we start walking down. And, and my, my room had all of my stuff in it, you know. And his room was like, some kind of bonanza, some like, you know, it was like carpet, you know, grizzly bear carpet, <laughs> like wood everywhere, big giant wood bed and everything, oh, and you know, cool bed, bathroom. So we walk into the bedroom, and she's like, well, this is really nice. And she goes, you, did you decorate this? I go, yeah, I kind of <laughs> <laughs> I like to decorate, you know. So we go, then she sits on the bed, and, uh, and then I sit on the bed, and I'm looking at her, and she says, uh, well, you know, do you want to like get a drink and maybe she could bring some booze in here? I go, yeah, okay. So uh, I, I go out and, and I go into his wine closet and I get a bottle of wine and the phone rings. <laughs> so I go, phone, I go, hello? He goes, hi, Steven, it's Michael. I go, oh, hi, how you doing? He goes, good, good. <clears throat> Look, I'm going to come home a little early. I'm going to come home in a little while. I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah, I'm coming back. I'm like, Coming back when? He goes, to, to the house. I go, oh my God. What, what do you mean? He goes, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just stopped at the Denny's right now. I'm going to eat a little bit, then I'm going to be about a half hour away. I go, all right, cool. And I ran to the bedroom and go, we got to go.
<laughs> She's out of space. <laughs> nah. I gotta have a terabyte on this thing. <laughs>